Well, it is good to be with you today. And uh, for those of you online, it's good to be with you online. And for those of you that are new with us in the room, thank you for, so much for being a part of our uh, day today and letting us be a part of your weekend. Uh, just a reminder of what Joe mentioned earlier in this service. There's a Connect card located in the seat back of the chair in front of you, or if you're at a table, the chair you're in. And as a guest with us today, we have a gift for you being with us. And fill that Connect card out before you leave. Go to the welcome table. Give the host that uh, that uh, connect card, and they'll give you a gift for being with us today. We're so grateful that you're here. Hey, Westside, let's uh, let everyone know that's new with us and those joining online how much we appreciate them today. Will you do that with me? Yeah. So thankful that you're here. So we are in this series called One, and what we've been doing in this series called One, the reason we're calling it One is we're one big church that is gathering together around the Gospel of Mark. And we are one church here, but we're part of hundreds of hundreds plus churches in Kansas City, Kansas, at Kansas City metro area, not just Kansas, and Missouri as well. And there are hundreds of churches doing this series with us from 25 countries around the world. We're all going through the Gospel of Mark together on the weekends. We are participating uh, in, join, in the listening, uh, listening to the Gospels, all the Gospels together of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we are watching the Gospels together in our groups. And whether you're watching it with your life group or just a couple other people, you're having a conversation about this, continue to do this. It's not too late to join in as Mark, as Joe's talked about earlier. It's not too late to join in this uh, journey as we watch the Gospel of Mark together. Our family's doing this. We're having great discussions as a family. Our kids are really engaging with this. So this is really good to do with your family as well. And, and, and we're in this series, and the reason we're looking at the, the, the Gospel of Mark is the Gospel of Mark is a very a powerful book that helps. Mark is this writer, this first century writer, who doesn't share his story per se. He shares Peter's story. Peter is a disciple of Jesus and was one that was there with Jesus from the beginning of Jesus' career and traveled with Jesus. And he tells Peter's story. Mark tells Peter's story with the purpose in mind. And he writes to this Greco-Roman world. This Greco-Roman world was not influenced as much by the Jewish tradition, just like we aren't influenced that much by the Jewish tradition. They, they were, aware, were aware, more aware of the Jewish tradition more than we were. They weren't as influenced by it, though. And so G, Mark writes to this world to convince them. And maybe you're here today and you need convincing of who Jesus is. And, and the reason that Mark wrote to this world is because he wanted them to come to the same conclusion that he came to, that Peter came to, so we could believe that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Son of God. And here's a series, big idea that we're looking at because this is really the overarching theme, in my opinion, of the Gospel of Mark. See, believing that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Son of God and King of all is the beginning of new life in him. Believing that Jesus, this Christos, this Messiah, this, this prophesied deliverer that would come through the nation of Israel, he's not just a deliverer, he is the Son of God, and better yet, he is a king. And he talks about a kingdom. Mark talks about Jesus and his kingdom. The kingdom of God is his central message. In fact, if you, if you look at this, this is the main thing that Jesus talks about in his, in, in, in his message. And, and today we're going to go somewhere, and I want to just tell you where we're going because I want you to see the pathway as it comes together that Mark shares. See, Mark, is, and it may, Mark writes his gospel, and if you read the gospel of Mark as you've been watching or listening to it, it may feel a little chaotic, and, and he, what Mark does is he's putting a lot of pieces together for us as the, the readers or the listeners in this. And he uses a pattern of like an ABA type of thing. He'll tell one story that means one thing. Then he'll interject this middle story that you're like, what did that have to do with that previous story? And then he tells another story that connects with the story he just told before this story. And he does this so in a genius way. It's a genius pattern because he's connecting a bigger thread that he wants you to see and you come to understand. And he has several of these threads weaving through the gospel of Mark. And here's a teaching big idea that we're going to see today, and I hope that you understand. And for some of you, I hope this brings that new life and new purpose and meaning for your life. And here's a teaching big idea for today. The king is calling you to be a part of his royal family and join his kingdom mission. That's what I want you to come away with today. That you can recognize that the king is calling you to be a part of his royal family and to join his kingdom Mission. Now, if you're feeling, if you immediately feel disqualified from being included in a royal family, I want you to know that this message is for you. If you feel like that, like you're desperate, and you came in today, and you're you're in a desperate situation, I want you to know this message is for you because Mark is going to show you 
how this message is for people who are, feel disqualified and people who are in desperate situations in their life. And together we're going to see how Mark shares this good news that a king is calling people into a royal family, his royal family, and to be on his kingdom mission. Now, in the opening chapter of Mark, he, he really jumps into Jesus in this declaration of the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is really the central message and the theme not of just Jesus' career. Mark wants you to know that the, the kingdom of God is central to you knowing Jesus because Jesus is a king unlike any other. And, and Jesus comes on the scene and he says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand or it's near. And he says, repent and believe, repent and believe in the good news, in the gospel of Jesus. And then Jesus gathers, he goes to some disciples and he goes to the scene and he finds Simon Peter, he finds Andrew, he finds James and John. We'll later know that, and we'll read today that they're called the sons of thunder. What a cool name. And he gets them along the seashore and he says, and he says to them, Jesus comes to them and says, follow me and I will make you become fishers. Of men. Now, interesting right here, this is not a request. Hey, will you follow me? This is a command because the king doesn't give requests. The king gives commands. <laughs> and Jesus is a king unlike any other. And his command is follow me. And you might feel, well, one, I don't know if I can follow you. Can I trust you? He's going to show you that you can trust him. And if you feel disqualified from being one that can follow Jesus' kingdom and be a part of his kingdom and royal family, he's going to let you know today and Mark's going to let you know through the stories he shares that no one's disqualified from this royal family. And in this, the, what Jesus does to this, he chooses his first disciples. And when he chooses his disciples to follow him, he calls them to follow him. You see what he does? He gives them the end zone. He says, this is what I'm going to turn you. I'm going to make you become, you're not this yourself. You're fishers of fisher, fish. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to take you stinky fishermen and turn you and make you into some, something so much bigger because to follow me is to fish for people. To follow is to fish. To be a part of, to follow me is to be a part of my kingdom mission. And in this, Mark gives his readers a clue. He gives you and I a clue into what it means to be chosen by the king. See, the call to follow Jesus is a call to join Jesus' mission. This is what it means to be called by the king. To be chosen by the king is, is, is a call to join in a kingdom mission. He chooses followers. He chooses us to follow him and share his good news. And now this is not something you can do on your own. It's not something that really you, you may feel that you have the qualifications to do so. Or you have the giftedness or the strength set. But you know what he's going to do for you just like he did for these disciples? He's going to make you become He's going to work this process. So the more that you follow Jesus, the more you will fish for him. See, that, that, this is what the, this newly announced king will do. Now, if you were a, newly, if you were a king on the scene, you, you, would, um, you would think that if you would come around and you would get the best of the best, wouldn't you? I mean, if you're trying to create a company or you want to get leaders on your team to you know, advance your organization that you're about ready to do or make or your kingdom if you're in Jesus' shoes, if you're mean, you're going to go after those with the most influence. You're going to go after those at the, the, the top of the class and the ones with the most talent. I mean, that's who I'm going to see. I'm going to look for the, most, the, most, the ones who have the best strength sets. But that's not Jesus. See, Jesus is a king unlike any other. And Mark continues to shed light on who Jesus chooses. He doesn't just choose ordinary fishermen. We read in Mark chapter two that he passed by a tax collector's booth and as he passed by the tax collector's booth, he sees Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth and he says to him, follow me and look what Levi does. He stands up, leaves all of his taxes that he's collected behind and follows Jesus. And Mark is like building tension right here because his audience, and maybe you would think this, we don't understand this as much as this first century did, especially this world. And really a tax collector, Jesus? I mean, couldn't you have chosen better people? Tax collectors were like the bottom of the barrel in the class systems, by the way. I mean, they don't, in, in the Jewish people, they consider them lower than sinners. In the Greek world, they were just oppressive people that were selfish. They used, their, their leverage was the government gave them, the king gave them permission to collect taxes for the king and the kingdom and gave the permission to the tax collectors to 
add that, more tax to that. So as they added more tax to it, they could benefit from it. They, and so the tax collectors had the wealthiest homes. They had all of this at the cost of their peers, at the cost of the very people that they served with. And so they had a very bad reputation. In fact, they were the worst of the worst. And Mark's building tension here by letting you know that Jesus chooses those with a horrible reputation to come be a part of his kingdom mission. I mean, in this, the, he, if Jesus is a king, you would think, well, of course, then he's that type of a king. He wants tax collectors, so he's going to collect taxes for himself. But that's not what Jesus is doing. He's not asking Mark to come and collect taxes for him. He's going to turn Mark into something more meaningful than collecting, not Mark, he's going to choose Matthew or Levi into something, make him something more meaningful. And as we'll later know, he's Matthew. And, and in this, he gives Matthew a purpose. And he gives all these disciples a greater purpose. So Jesus is starting this new kingdom, asking people, not asking, commanding them, calling them, choosing them to follow him. And he carefully chooses them and gives them their purpose. And Jesus delegates his authority to them. We read this in, in chapter three. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And look at it, he called and chose them. And then he appointed, and that word appoint really is, is a, a neat word in the Greek. It, we, we translate, and the translators do the best they can here to translate this word appoint. But Jesus does something more than appoint. There's a, there's, he made this group. He, he, he made them disciples. He made them apostles. He, he says in the parenthetical, whom he also named apostles. And in in that word appointed, he's going to say it again in a second. It's a point. It's really this creation. He, 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 he makes something out of them. And so he appointed the, 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 disciple, the 12 uh, whom he gave, he named apostles, so they might be with him. And he sent them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Look what he does. He gives them a purpose. I mean, he calls them and immediately gives them a purpose and gives them the authority to fulfill that purpose. He's the most incredible king, most incredible leader that this world has ever seen. And he appointed the 12. Again, we see that. He makes the 12 here. Simon, who he gave the name Peter, which is the account of the story that Mark is sharing. Um, he, he calls James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boananarius. And, and he gave, and that, that is the th sons of thunder, and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the Iscariot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. See, interesting that when you look at this list, I mean, this is not the standout crowd uh, that, that we would probably put in our A list. Because Jesus' list isn't comprised of what we would consider A list people. He doesn't consider this th that. In fact, in fact, Jesus' day, the way that rabbis and disciples worked is, is in that day and age, uh, the disciples would apply for a certain rabbi, just like you and I would apply for a certain college. You know, like there's this college that you remember you wanted to go to. And for those of you that are about ready to go to school or you just entered school, you went through the application process and you said, well, this is what I want to be. And this is what I want, the education I want. So you pick the colleges that have the best education for you. So you apply for them. Well, this, era, this time and era, this rabbis or teachers were chosen in a way by their disciples. And so they would apply. And then the, 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 the rabbis would then choose the best of those disciples. The cream of the crop, the ones that rose, the ones that had the most promise because it also showed good for you when you had someone with promise follow you. But look what Jesus does. See, Jesus doesn't choose them based on th th that. See, Jesus, he, he doesn't let them choose him first. Jesus chooses them first. He does it so differently. He chooses the disciples. The disciples don't choose him. You know, we sometimes want to choose mentors in our life for what they can do for us. I mean, really, that's why you choose a college you want, because you, they, they're going to be the best for me. And Jesus is not a means to your end. you got to understand this. If you want to follow Jesus, you need to know clearly. He's not a means to benefit your life. I mean, there is a benefit to your life. Don't get me wrong. But we don't follow him because he's a means to our end, our selfish end. You know what he is? He is the end within himself. I love what one commentator writes. He says, Jesus, unlike a rabbi, is not a means to an ulterior good, but 
is himself the final good. See, Jesus calls you to follow him because of who he is. See, Mark is leading us to something, to see something big here. And the, what he wants you to see is what can Jesus make of those who follow him? What can Jesus do with you? See, the wrong question, and then we've got to ask the right question. The wrong question is, is, is this. It's what can I do with Jesus? And that's not what we should be asking because it's not what can I do with Jesus? What can I do with Jesus on my side? How could he help me be a better leader? How, how could he help me have a better life or make more money or be more successful? It's not that question at all. It's not what can I do with Jesus, but Mark wants you to ask the question, what can Jesus do with you. See, when we approach Jesus this way, it's more of a like, God, I know that you have a greater purpose and you can make something out of me that I cannot even do myself. And I'm not coming to you because of what I want you to do for me. I'm coming to you because I'm going to be a part of what you're doing. And I know you can make something more out of me. See, it's fully coming to Jesus and saying, what can you do with me? Because Jesus is a king who calls and chooses people to follow him because of what he wants to make them to be. So what does it mean to be a part of and chosen by Jesus? Well, Mark goes on to say, and his mothers and brothers came. And he's telling the story. Jesus' family comes out standing outside, and they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, but they said to him, hey, your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mothers and brothers? And they're like, uh, uh, Jesus, they're outside. <laughs> um, they're out there, Jesus. You're a little crazy. Um, but then he looks at them and says, who are my mother and brothers? Looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever look at this does the will of God. He is my mother and sister and mother. He is my brother, my sister. And mother. See, if Jesus is a king, Mark wants you to know something. Then his family is a royal family. And it's not just isolated to his family. It's very inclusive. It's including those who do the will of God. See, Jesus here elevates the value of those who are part of his kingdom. He elevates the value of those who follow him. See, Jesus gives them a royal status. They are family. They are royal family. See, Jesus sees the people in his kingdom as his family. See, he's a king like any other. What kingdom calls the king, the, his people of his kingdom, his family? See, those who do the will of God, he recognizes that this is his royal family. And, and Jesus is not going to treat you as subjects because that's what kings do with earthly power. He's unlike any earthly king. He doesn't treat you as subjects. He treats you as a sibling. Do you see the value of being a part of his kingdom and how he sees you? He chooses you to be in his family and he wants to serve and he honors those in his kingdom the same way that we would honor and serve a, a father or a mother. See, those who are part of his kingdom are his family and they are part of the family mission, a kingdom mission to do the will of God. The very mission Jesus came to this earth to do the will of God and fulfill the will of God. And here's the good news. I want you to know today, and Mark wants you to know, Jesus is calling you to be a part of this royal family and accept this kingdom mission. He's calling you to be a part of his royal family and join his kingdom mission. And this is great news for people like you and people like me who are ordinary people. So what does it mean then to be a part of this family? What does it mean then to be a part of this family? Mark leads us there. And he shares a, a, a time that Jesus goes by uh, and he's by the Sea of Galilee. He begins teaching and he gets in this boat because a crowd kind of is too big, pushing him into the sea. At, at the edge of the sea, he gets in the boat, begins teaching the people and he begins teaching in parables. Parables are short stories that, that share kingdom truths. And as he's doing this, he tells this one specific parable that includes four soils. And he tells this and he says the he says the, that, that, that this, some seed, and he talks, it's a farming parable of a farmer's casting seed into four soils. And the first seed, has this, the farmer cast it, falls into a hard path and, and falls along the path, and birds come down and take the seed away. The second uh, soil that this farmer plants in is a, a rocky ground, and in this rocky ground, there's not much soil, and so there's immediate growth, but it has no depth. 
And when the sun comes out, it scorches it. Then the third soil he describes as more seed fell into thorns and it become choked and, and it produced no harvest. And then the good soil, the fourth soil, produced grain. And it multiplied its yield, 30, 60, even up to 100 fold. And the disciples pulled Jesus after some time had passed and pull him aside and say, hey, Jesus, tell us the meaning of the parable of the seed and the farmer. And this is what Jesus says. The sower sows the word. And that word is the message. That word is the, 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 the same word that we have in, in, that John uses as the logos, that he the, sows the word. And John would say in his opening disciple, Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word, the logos. And the seed is the word. The seed is Jesus. The seed is the message of Jesus, the word of God. And then he goes on to say, these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, this is the first soil, the hard path, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And then he goes on to the second soil, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. I'm so grateful to hear this. This is great news for me. But they have no root in themselves but endure for a while. And then look at this. When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, as soon as people begin to make fun of you because you follow Jesus or, or, or question your faith because it's, it's so unscientific to believe in someone like Jesus, what happens? Um, persecution arises on account of the world and immediately they fall away. Third soil, those are ones sown, the seed is sown among thorns. And this soil is the one, those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. You know, that claim to fame, that wealth and popularity and, and comfort in our life. And the desires for other things. We desire other things more than we desire God. And it enters in our life and he says, choke the word. And it proves, look at this, unfruitful. Because this is the point of the fourth soil. Which he explains, those that were sown among the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. Hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. See, Jesus says that those that are part of my kingdom family, those are part of my kingdom mission or part of my royal family are this fourth soil type of person. See, they hear the word. See, the king's family, look at this. The king's family are those who hear God's message, accept God's truth, and share Jesus' story with others. See, this is what the parable says. They hear the message. They hear the truth, the, the, uh, the message of Jesus. And it's not just hearing it. We accept it as truth. We accept it for ourselves. And you know you accept it when you live by it, when you follow it, when you obey it. You, just, uh, you accept it, the, that word. You accept its meaning. You accept its truth. And to bear fruit... It's really about sharing Jesus with others because what does fruit do? Fruit produces more seed. Fruit multiplies itself and becomes more seed to spread. And to spread the message of Jesus and the good news of kingdom is what fruit does. It's not to fall away because of the human arguments. It's not to stop following Jesus as soon as trouble comes in our life. It's not to let the hook of wealth and materialism and popularity and prosperity deceive us, making us unfruitful. It's to hear, accept, and join Jesus in sharing this message with others because the king is calling you to be a part of a royal family with a kingdom purpose. And Jesus goes on in his teaching, and Mark goes on in his story, and he tells some more parables about the kingdom of God and how it's coming and it's growing, and he says, you're not going to be able to hide it. You're not going to be able to put it in a dark spot because light just ex lights the entire room, and you're not going to stop it. You're not going to hide it, and you're not going to stop it. And then Jesus and his disciples get in a boat to cross a sea, and a storm rises because Jesus is on the way, and there, he's on a purpose. And in the middle of this, there's this great teaching opportunity that happens, a storm or a squall. This powerful storm comes up. Everybody in the boat panics, as you would, because you now are in fear of your life because these storms are so dangerous. Who knows what they're doing, bailing water. And then all of a sudden, they recognize, they're looking for, where's Jesus in this? And they go to find Jesus. They're afraid from their life. They're desperate in their, their situation right here. They're desperate for their life here. And they find Jesus. He's so at peace in this situation. 
He's so at, in com- he's so at peace within his soul. He's sleeping in the boat on a pillow. <laughs> and they find Jesus, and this is what happens. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you hear the concern? Do you hear the desperation in their voice? Do you not care that we're perishing? And Jesus awakes. He, he wakes up, and he, watch this. I mean, you just got to check this out. With his words, <laughs> with his words, he takes authority. Because the king's word has authority. And he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? I mean, have you not been walking with me? I've... I've proven my authority. I mean, you've been with me. I've proven my authority over, over sickness. I've proved my authority over Satan. We've, I've cast out demons. I've proved my authority over, over um, sin. I've even proved my authority over death. Have you still no faith? And they were filled with a great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. See, Jesus isn't an ordinary king. He's a king that is over all. Nothing, nothing, and no one, nothing or no one is outside his authority. And he's proved his authority time and time again. And here Jesus proves his authority because he's a king that's so different. He's the king over all creation. It's not just a king of an isolation and a geography. See, he's the king of the universe. He's the king with authority over all. And his words stop the wind and the waves. It's the same word that brings life in the beginning of creation because he is the king of all creation. It's the same word that spoke creation into existence. It's the same word that brings life to people who are, who are, who, who, who are desperate for life. It's the same word that heals the sick. It's the same word that heals those and and saves those that are in sin. It's the same word, and now the same word is the authority over all, and he reveals himself in this way because he's a king that wants you to know that if you're desperate, he's a king you can trust. He's a king you can trust, and this king is calling you to be a part of his royal family and join his kingdom mission. And this king wants to bring life to you and make you a part of that family by bringing you life. And you may think you're disqualified from being in the king's family. You may feel like you, 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 are, you are disqualified from, because of your past or whatever the case may be. And Mark is going to let you know that no one is disqualified. See, you don't have to worry and fear being disqualified from being in the kingdom and the family of God. So Jesus, the storm go, calms, they arrive to the other side of the sea and immediately a demon-possessed man finds Jesus. And this is a demon-possessed man who his society had abandoned. And this was, and, and he was, they were outcast him. They, they put him out. In, in fact, the only place that he could find solace, the only place that would welcome him as a home was a, the graveyard, outside a tomb, outside the city. These tombs were the only place that welcomed him. The place of the dead was the only place that said, you can be here. He was welcome nowhere else, and no one else could help him. They tried to bind him to keep him from being destructive, but, but nobody could help him. Nobody could help his situation. Have you ever been in a situation like that where you felt like nobody could help you? See, this man was there. And this man was in a place where people had given up on him. Maybe you felt like that. Maybe you felt like people have given up on you. That because of what you're, like, nobody can help you and people have given up on you. They've, they've stopped giving up on you. They've excluded you. Maybe you've felt like this man and you've had so much pain that the only way to relieve your pain, as Mark would describe it, he would cut himself and cause more pain. And if you feel that pain, I want you to know something. Jesus is a king who's chosen you and he's calling you. See, that was the man, the pain this man faced. And look what happens here. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down. 
before him. <laughs> he gets in the place, in the position before a king. And using his, the power of his word, Jesus takes authority over the demons, over the force of evil inside of this man. And Jesus does for what this man, what nobody else can do and not this man could even do for himself. He saves him. He delivers him. He casts the demon. This man was desperate and Jesus becomes the answer to his healing and brings him to restore, restores him. It was so radical of a restoration that the locals feared Jesus. They knew how bad this man was, and Jesus had immediately restored him. They immediately saw the change in this man's life. And then Jesus turns, does something. See, Jesus does something with this man. Not only does he make him a part of his family, he sends him on the kingdom mission. He turns him into the, a missionary. The man wanted to get in the boat with Jesus and go back with him. I mean, who wouldn't? I want to be with you, Jesus. And Jesus says this. He did not permit him, but said to him, Go. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim the Decapolis, which is this 10 city area, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. See, to follow me is to fish for people. To follow me is not just to experience what God can do for you. It's to let him make you in something that's greater than you think about yourself. It's to be a part of his, not just his royal family, but it's also to be a part of his kingdom mission. And Jesus he will even choose a demoniac. And if Jesus chooses a demoniac and makes him into a missionary, what can Jesus do with you? The king is calling you. The king is calling you to join his family and be on his mission. You are not disqualified. See, the king is calling those who are in fear and forgotten. The king is calling you. Your pain doesn't disqualify you from the king's family. Your king is calling you. Your past doesn't disqualify you from the king's family. Your king is calling you. Your fears do not disqualify you from the king's family. Your king is calling you. Everyone in God's kingdom is a part of his family. Your future is not dead. Just like this man thought his future was dead because the king is calling you. He wants to make something of you. More than what you can do with him in your life, he wants you to surrender that and let him make something out of you that he sees is best. And while you may feel forgotten and while others may look over you, I want you to know that your king is looking at you and is choosing you to be a part of his royal family and join his kingdom mission. You are not forgotten. You're invited by the king to be in his family and share his mission and share his good message with others who hear to, need to hear this good news of his kingdom. He gets back in the boat. Jesus gets back in the boat, crosses the sea again. Now a religious leader, a ruler named Jairus, steps and finds Jesus in the middle of this as they're walking in the crowd. He comes to Jesus in a panic and desperation and says, my daughter is dying. Will you just come and touch her? Just put your hands on her. I know if you put your hands on her, she'll be healed. And we see this. Then one, come, one of the rulers in the synagogue, Jairus by name, sees, seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with them. And while they're on their way, just to, so Jesus could touch his daughter, check out what the story turns. Another interjection is, is said, another storyline enters in from this woman who had this issue of blood, this very embarrassing illness that no doctor could cure for 12 years. She's lived with this. This illness made her an outcast. This illness mean that she couldn't be with her family. This illness must, meant that she was rejected by the religious people. She was rejected by society. She was, she was considered unclean and she'd have to isolate herself. What a lonely place to be. And she thought... If I could just touch him. Jesus, Jairus, Jairus wants Jesus to touch his daughter, and she's like, if I could just touch him. She presses through the crowd, and she grabs a hold of the hem of his garment because she believes if, that's, if, I, if that's all I can get, that's all I need is I can get a hold of him. And immediately she was healed. And in that moment, Jesus stops it, feeling the power go out of him. He says, hey, stop, wait a second, who touched me? And the disciples are like, are you crazy? 
You are crazy. Everybody, look at this crowd. Everybody's around you, Jesus. Everybody's going to be touching you. No, you know, no, someone touched me. And in this moment, the woman would then have to face her worst fear because she would have to make herself known. She'd have to let everybody know that she was the one who touched him. And she would have to face the embarrassment of making everybody else unclean because whenever an unclean person would touch people, they would immediately be ceremonially unclean. And she would have to confront that reality and confess that. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in with fear. And obviously you see the fear because of what would happen to her if she confessed that she just made everybody here unclean. And trembling, watch what happens, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, 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 because to be chosen by the king is to be included in his royal family. He gives her a place in the title. He calls her daughter. Your faith has made you well. The Greek word for that is sozo. Your faith has saved you. That's what sozo means. In other areas of the New Testament, saved. (laughs) See, it's also healing. Jesus healed her, but that healing just took place. And now her faith, he says, has made you a part of a bigger family. Your faith has given you a position in my kingdom because you are not disqualified. Everybody else is disqualified, but you are not disqualified from being a part of my family because I've chosen you. Your faith. Daughter. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This be whole. This be whole. See, you might be looking for this and you might be looking for wholeness in every other area of life. Jesus is the one that makes you whole. He gives you peace. Be healed of your disease. Be healed of your disease. She was not disqualified from her con- because of her j- condition. Jesus chose her. And, and don't worry about Jairus' daughter. Guess what? Jairus' daughter, he raised her back to life. Because Jesus is a king for the hurting, the desperate. He's a king. And the king is calling those who are hopeless and helpless. The king is calling you. And I want you to know that the king is calling. If you feel hopeless today, the king is calling you. It's not a hopeless situation. You are not disqualified because of your past. You are not disqualified because of a regret. You're not disqualified because you don't look the part. You're not the part. You're not, you're not the, the strong or as, uh, you don't have the, the qualities or you're not as popular. It doesn't matter. The king is calling you to be a part of his family. And you need to know this. No one is disqualified from being in King Jesus' family. No one, including you, is disqualified. And sometimes we disqualify ourselves. But don't, disqual- don't, don't, don't disqualify yourself when the king has qualified you. The king is calling you to be part of his royal family and join his kingdom mission. The question for you today is which soil will you be? Are you going to be the first soil that doesn't let the hear the word of God and just kind of falls away? You're going to be the second soil that that takes a little bit of root, root, but it's so rocky, and then all of a sudden there's joy in the moment, but you don't accept its truth and you don't really follow and, and, and figure out what it means to be a part of this kingdom family, this royal family. You don't really grow in your faith. And as soon as persecution comes and someone says, you're a follower of Jesus, you go, no, no, not not, not me, not me. You're going to be the third soil person that gets so distracted after the comforts of life that you forget the king who has authority over life. Will you be the fourth soil person who hears the message? accepts it as truth and shares it with others. See, that's the question I want to leave you with today. Will you hear God's message today? Accept Jesus' truth and join his mission by sharing his good news. Will you hear this message that the king 
is calling you. He's chosen you. Will you accept that to be true for you? And will you join his kingdom mission to let others know? And if at any moment today you you might be here and far from God and you might say, I, I feel something inside of me. You know what that is? That's a king calling you. And today he wants you to hear this message, accept this as true for you. Turn to him, repent and believe. Believe it and join in this ultimate powerful kingdom with a king that loves you enough for you to be a part of his family. And maybe you're here today and you've been a part of the family, but you've been a second or third soil person not being fruitful. Let the king produce fruit in you as you share this and join his mission. Let me pray for us. Father, there are those here today that need to put their trust in you for the first time because you're drawing them into your, your family. God, may they do that. Right now, may they do that. May they trust you as their savior that who lived the perfect life, who died to pay the penalty of our sin, who is alive today and you've called us to follow you. May they hear that message for them, accept that it's true and begin following you. And you give them new life right now. You give them a new beginning. And God, for those of us who have not, who, who've not been fruitful because we've been distracted or we've been in different, a different type of soil, may you make us fourth soil followers of Jesus. Your family who understands that, accepts it and shares that news with others. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Our prayer partners are available. They'd love to pray with you in any way for anyone. God bless you, Westside. May you be his royal family.